So uh, welcome back from lunch. Uh, we're starting one, two minutes earlier uh, for the benefit of the speakers. Uh, my name is Jose Fortes. I'm actually here on behalf of Libby uh, Hellwood, who was going to coordinate this session, but she can't be present. Uh, the session has been organized by Libby Hellwood and uh, Joss Napande and Anna Monfils. Um, and we have nine speakers. Uh, each speaker will talk for 10 minutes. So I've, I'm going to be helped by David uh, Fitchmuller. Um, he'll help keep the time. He's uh, very efficient and very mean. So stick to the schedule. Um, so um, uh, keep in mind that at the end of the session, we have 30 minutes for questions. So the speakers will likely use the entirety of their 10 minutes. Just uh, write down the questions either on chat or on your notebook, and you can ask um, questions at the end of the session, the last 30 minutes. Uh, so um, uh, without uh, further ado, I think I provided all the reminders I would like to. So just uh, for those who are coming in, the name of the session is uh, LTD 14, Ensuring Fair Principles and Open Science Through Integration of Biodiversity Data. Um, fair in this case means uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and it's exactly two o'clock, so I'll introduce Quentin Groom. Uh, please uh, take the floor and I'll let you explain uh, the title and everything else. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're ready to go. So what I'm talking about today is about the use of data on the domesticated and cultivated organisms. This is literally the elephant in the room in some countries, um, not in Bulgaria. Uh, they have other cultivated and uh, domestic organisms, but it is very important. And we are just ignoring this at the moment. Us ecologists here, and many of us would consider ourselves as ecologists, uh, we treat biotic interactions as the essence of ecology. It's all about how communities work together, what eats what, what, uh, what parasitizes what. This is a, a species interaction network that I built of the species that are wild within the botanic garden at Miser, where I work. The uh, green dots are the wild native organisms. The pink dots are um, cultivated organisms, and the size of the nodes are the num uh, scaled by the, si the number of interactions they have. As you can see, by far the, the most interacting species there are honeybees, Apis mellifera, and they interact with an enormous number of plants um, doing pollination, collecting uh, nectar, um, but they also get eaten by things, they also get parasitized by things. There were lots of fruit trees on there. Uh, their berries get eaten by uh, birds and by mammals. And they also get visits by lots of the wild pollinators as well as the honeybees. And there are things like uh, Felis catus, the domestic cat. Um, every single 
uh, cat in Belgium is meant to be uh, neutered by law. So every cat in the botanic garden is a sterile cat, and yet there's quite a lot of cats. They come from all the neighboring houses, but they are also part of the ecosystem. This is one ecosystem. We know that the domestic cats eat the birds and the, uh, and the mammals within the garden, um, and there are also human beings. Those human beings get uh, parasitized by mosquitoes and ticks, but probably the, the human beings are also eating some of the fruits of the garden as well. It's all part of one ecosystem, and you can't separate the cultivated and domesticated organisms from the wild ones. 29% of the world's terrestrial ecosystems have been uh, significantly modified by human activity. That's from the world. If you just take terrestrial ecosystems in Europe, you're probably talking way over 90% of eco ecosystems. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's sort of 99 to 100% of ecosystems haven't been significantly modified in Europe by human activity. If you look at the biomass in the world of, uh, of wild mammals, that's that tiny little triangle over here, 0 0.007 gigatons of carbon. Um, Human beings, just the one species, is almost 10 times as map the amount of, uh, of biomass. And if you take livestock over here, you're talking more than 10 times as much livestock as there are wild mammals on the earth. Here's a quote from Keith McCann. Biodiversity researchers have focused on diversity at the cost of ignoring networks of interactions between organisms that characterize ecosystems. How many times have you heard already this week about lists of species, about biodiversity being lists? We're, I'm as guilty as anybody else of calling biodiversity lists of species, but biodiversity is both the list of species and all the interactions between those species, and we tend to forget those interactions. So we had a project uh, still running, uh, still a little bit left to go, where we were looking at citizen science and how citizen science can inform invasive species management. And one of our examples was mosquitoes. The top, mosquitoes are wonderful. They have amazing numbers of interactions with other things. So birds eat, mos uh, birds eat mosquitoes, bats eat mosquitoes, but also mosquitoes feed on birds and feed on mammals as well. And some of those mammals are domestic animals, some of those mammals are human beings, but also fish eat mosquitoes. Uh, your domestic goldfish will eat mosquito larvae in the pond in your garden. So if you're trying to understand mosquito population dynamics in an urban ecosystem, you can't ignore all the cultivated and domestic organisms. Here's what our naturalist, uh, uh, a lovely example of rainbow lorikeets in their native uh, habitat in Australia. Um, but what are they sitting on? Oops. What are they sitting on? They're sitting on a sunflower. That sunflower natively comes from North America. It's a cultivated organism in Australia. And if you're trying to understand rainbow lorikeet habitat uh, and their population dynamics, I think it's important to know what they eat. But iNaturalist says in their blurb on their website, our scientific data partners are often not interested in or downright alarmed by the observations of captivated or cultivated organisms. I don't believe this. I believe as an ecologist, I am interested in the captive and cultivated organisms that you can see in this image. Captive and cultivated organisms interact in many different ways. Here's a domestic cat eating a jumping mouse in North America. So predation, there are many instances of parasitism. Uh, humans and cats share uh, over 20 different parasites and diseases. They also share those with uh, wild animals as well. And there are many examples of herbivorous, herbivorous uh, uh, domestic organisms as well. There are genetic impacts. So here we see in the backyard in Britain, somebody's cultivated bluebell. Uh, it's a hybrid uh, hyacinthoides, but there's also native um, hyacinthoides in Britain. And this native bee will cause cross-pollination with native hyacinthoides with garden plants, and yet we're not recording all of the garden plants, and so we can't predict what's going to happen in the future with genetic impacts if we don't know what's actually growing and being part of the ecosystem. 
I don't need to tell you uh, we just came through a pandemic. There are many other examples of diseases that are mediated both by wild and uh, cultivated organisms. Uh, I picked a pig here because there's a complicated interaction between bats and pigs and the transfer of Nipah virus um, in Indonesia, but there are many, many other examples. As an invasion biologist, I actually want to know what people are keeping in their houses. What are people keeping in their aquariums? Uh, what reptiles in uh, vivariums? Uh, because those are the species I need to look out for when I'm trying to uh, do um, early warning for uh, in new invasive species. This is a North American snake, I think, uh, found in Belgium. So we're trying to understand things like urban ecology and urban uh, agroecology. Uh, these are two uh, species that were once kept as pets before they escaped and are now extremely abundant uh, in Europe, the gray squirrel from North America and the rosy cheeked parakeet from India. And I can kind of hear all the, the ecological modelers uh, talking and screaming at me, but I want to be able to model the, uh, the climate niche of these species, and I don't want all of these lions from Africa turning up in European data sets because they kept them in zoos. Well, of course you don't, and there is a solution to this. And the solution is to use Darwin Core and the, the vocabularies who are given to you to make this quite clear. So we have something called degree of establishment. Two of the terms within the degree of establishment vocabulary are captive or cultivated. And so all you need to do when you're publishing your data sets, if it comes from iNaturalist, iNaturalist could do this. They could say, this is a captivated organism. And then anybody doing Niche modeling could just filter out all of these, and anyone trying to do uh, horizon scanning for new invasive species could actually include all of these. So that's all I have to say. I have one minute left. I can say thank you to all of my uh, funders and contributors. So Alien CSI did the work on citizen science. Uh, Miser Botanic Garden funded me to come here. And I should also mention the World Fair uh, project run by Codata. There's going to be a a uh, plenary talk on Friday afternoon, I believe, on this from Deborah. Uh, I've forgotten her surname. Hi, Deborah. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say. Please do publish your data. Uh, time goes by fast. Thanks for sticking to the 10 minutes. Uh, the next speaker. Um, is Lorian van uh, Maldigan, and I probably are not saying the name right. Um, the presentation is recorded, uh, and uh, um, Lorian's uh, colleague, uh, Mark Portier, is available um, through Zoom for questions that might be asked at the end of the session. So, Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. In this session's part, we'll explain what the World Register of Marine Species is and the work that is in the pipeline to publish it as linked open data. Hopefully you are all aware of what the World Register of Marine Species is, but for those of you that do not know, we'll give a brief explanation. So the World Register of Marine Species is, as the name kind of suggests, an authoritative classification and catalogue of marine names. So the catalogue includes the taxonomic names of all known marine species, but besides that also offers information on the mutual relationship between those taxon names. For example, the original names, the accepted versus unaccepted names, the taxonomic classification, and so on. It also offers information on ecological traits of species, their distributions, and it also heavily links to the scientific literature that describes this information. The World Register of Marine Species exists now for over 15 years, and during that time, it has been growing in its content and quality. And this is all thanks to the voluntary efforts of over 300 experts worldwide. 
All the information that is included in Worms is relatively easy accessible through its portal and web services. And as such, it also applies the basic FAIR principles, but there is still room for improvement. For illustration purposes, we give you here the example of Archinus Orca or the Kelo Whale. On the first image, you can see all the taxonomic names that are related to this species. And you can also see here that each taxon name in Worms is associated with a unique LSID. On the second image, you can see the additional information that is stored for each taxon name, such as the distribution, species traits, and images of the species. Worms plays a key role in the marine biodiversity domain, in the first place as an authoritative classification catalog, which serves as a reference for the correct usage of marine taxonomes and their taxonomic relationships. Besides that, it also serves as a quality control tool then for the correct uses of taxonomes. And it also functions as a marine taxonomic backbone, uh, which is used by various global databases and infrastructures, such as, for example, LifeWatch, OBIS, and GOES. Next to its taxonomic value, WORMS is also valued for the information it offers on species traits, which, is, um, which forms a critical component in ecological marine research. Because of its role as a taxonomic backbone, WORMS has always had to be adaptable to new ways in which the identifiers pinned down by WORMS are being used in application and also applied in research. More recently, there has also been the growing call for globally uniform identifiers, coming from both the fair data sharing principles and the investment into globally open and interlinked digital trend representations of our oceans. These have introduced the fundamentals for growing a marine knowledge graph and have led us to publish worms as fully linked open data using semantic web technologies. Here we'll briefly describe the choices that we will have to make when publishing taxonomic information as linked open data. The first of which being the selection and application of specific vocabularies for the description and interconnected linking of taxon names. And the second being the tension between hanging on to a historic persistent identifier and providing a dereferenceable URI that supports the follow your nose property. And then choices that are yet to be made are related to how we will link to other relevant registries, how we will design meaningful predicates for inbound links to the register, and then also more technically, how we will divide the available content into meaningful subsections for retrieval of optional detail, and provide a roadmap for meaningful transformations of the full register to allow for an effective consumption of relevant parts into a specific data consumption scenarios. For the selection of vocabularies, we started out from the RDF that was already being published for worms and extended it with other semantic terms to make the model more complete. Here you can see the model that we have so far. Most information was already described using Darwin Core and Dublin Core terms, but we also added schema.org terms from the Bioschema profile, which are, of course, based on the Darwin Core terms. As such, they are redundant in the information they give. But depending on the query construct to traverse this graph, they could still come in handy. Because literature resources are an important part of the worms catalog, as they serve as proof of the given information, we also extended the model to be able to make source annotations on properties such as the vernacular names, distribution, other taxon names, and so on. This you can see on the left here, where the source annotation structure depicts the type of annotation and then also documents the annotated property and the literature source together with an edit history if that's present. This is then the Orchidus Orca example from the introduction, but this time given as RDF. And you can see the taxon information of the species itself, and then also the taxonomic classification. Besides taxon information, um, synonyms, sources, and other links are also listed. And here you can see a source annotation for a vernacular name. And as you can see, these annotation constructs are to exist next to the actual um, vernacular name statements. And lastly, there is also information on resource metadata, citation, and the distribution, which also has a source annotation. 
And finally, we would like to thank LifeWatch and EOS Clive for making this work possible. If you have any questions about the content or technical implications, there's a colleague around who is more than happy to answer these. Okay, we right on time. So the next speaker is going to be Sarah Hansen. She's coming to us uh, remotely, but she's live. So she'll be around for questions as well. So Sarah, if you're there, please um, take over. Very right, good. Are you seeing my slides? Yep. Perfect. Um, thank you. As you just said, my name is Sarah Hansen and I'm a grad student at Central Michigan University. Um, today I'm presenting along with my collaborators, Nico Franz and Anna Monfils, on the role of early career scientists in FAIR data. So in order to create a landscape of FAIR open science across biodiversity science, we have to look to the individuals involved in the data pathway. Today, I'll be specifically talking about early career scientists, including graduate students who are often working at many levels of data creation and publication as they're designing their own projects. Looking at this example workflow from Hack et al. 2019, they could be data collectors during their field work, data curators as they organize their data for analysis, and data users. If we work to improve data at those stages along the data pathway, we could also look to improving them at the stages of aggregation and dissemination. Another reason to be specifically thinking about early career scientists is they have the opportunity earlier in their career to learn data specific skills using best practices when they have the time and freedom to learn and apply those. So really what we're talking about is training the emerging workforce of biodiversity scientists and thinking about how we can support that training such that we have a data literate workforce moving forward that will help us achieve our ultimate goals around fair data. Many organizations are already pointing to the need for workforce training and data skills across the biodiversity community in order to make advances in our biodiversity data. So a few publications I'm pulling out here are the NASA report on biological collections, the BCon report on extending US biodiversity collections, a paper on data quality from the Tadwig Biodiversity Data Quality Interest Group, a paper on Biodiversity Informatics Curriculum, including work by GBIF and the Tadwig Biodiversity Informatics Curriculum Group, a recent paper on bioscience on enabling a digital extended specimen network, and a paper on the 21st century workforce and other resources from Blue. So we want to be able to bring all scientists on board and support future biodiversity data science careers, and we know that really starts with training the workforce of emerging scientists. But how do we meet the challenge and address barriers to engaging early career scientists in biodiversity data science and data sharing? One of the biggest barriers is a lack of knowledge and training in biodiversity data skills. So we could be teaching these skills at all educational stages, continuing even beyond graduate school, so that biodiversity scientists are set up from the beginning and knowing how to manage and share their data and ultimately be part of the landscape of fair data and open science. Currently, we have unbalanced risks and rewards for sharing fair data, particularly for early career scientists who are at a vulnerable position in their career. So we want to value the time spent on acquiring data skills, applying best practices in your work with data, and sharing data with the community so that there are positive professional outcomes for choosing to do the extra work associated with publishing rather than the potential to be held back in your career advancement. Even if emerging scientists are really on board with these ideas in biodiversity data science, they may still not know how to actually get started in this field and how to be meaningfully involved. So we wanna be creating on-ramps into the field of biodiversity data science and informatics, which really starts with workforce training. We want everyone to have a seat at the table to make sure the tools we're creating are going to work for us long-term. I'm gonna go through each of these challenges and kind of the ways we as the biodiversity data community can help to meet these needs. As we know, there's a lot of domain specific knowledge that has to be gained by biodiversity scientists during their education. They're learning, just to name a few, taxonomy, methodologies, ecosystems, earth science, evolution, scientific writing. So how can we actually fit in the data skills training and integrate data science as a part of biodiversity science? In K through 12 education, students are learning about the scientific method and the process of science. Up until recently, this hasn't really included the data focus parts. This graphic from Understanding Science shows that sharing data is a critical part of scientific dis discovery and exploration. 
So if students are exposed to resources like this that center the data early on, they're getting a more realistic view of science and starting to see the value of data and how they fit into what they think of as real science. In undergraduate training, you're starting to choose a field of study and getting more and more domain specific skills. So there's an opportunity early in undergraduate education to start cultivating an understanding of biodiversity data and why it's so important for all biodiversity sci scientists to have some core data skills. This example is from the Blue Module Building Biodiversity Datasets and it's introducing students to the basics of data structure, key terms, and why data are such an important part of science, not a separate entity. You are at the half minute mark, uh, half time mark. Thanks. In graduate school, you're learning how to actually design a project. So you're thinking about what data you wanna collect and what methods you're going to use to collect those data. A lot of your education at this stage is going to revolve around those two components, but you actually also need to be thinking about database design and how your data fit together and how you're going to manage your data after you collect them. If we're teaching these at the graduate level, then emerging scientists will ultimately be better prepared to think about issues like sharing data and using public data downstream. Once you've gone through your formal training, there's lots of great resources by organizations like the Carpentries and GBIF to continue on in your data science education. Even though these already exist, a lot of professionals don't have the time to take advantage of them. So the most important thing at this stage might actually be institutional support and incentivizing those skills throughout your career. Here in an overly simplified path to publishing research results, you basically gather your data, analyze them, and then publish papers. However, if you make this pathway more data intensive, it gets a lot longer. You're taking the time to clean your data, which takes more time if you're also using publicly available data, integrating across data types, formatting for publication and meeting the FAIR principles, publishing your data, and then publishing papers. If you're choosing this path, it's going to take you more time to publish those papers, and you might end up with fewer than your colleagues. If you couple that effort with the additional effort involved in collaborating with multiple stakeholders who have different priorities and levels of compliance, it's a lot of extra work, especially for someone just starting out in their career. We don't want early career scientists to be hurt by doing that extra work, so we need to value those skills and that time spent on the data. Getting to a fair open data landscape is relying on creating the environment and the value system to support it. So what would that actually look like? It could be increased job opportunities for the people with those data skills. A blue survey found that advisors accepting graduate students said they would preferentially accept students with data skills. But we can continue to apply that same mindset and be really intentional about opening up job opportunities in biodiversity science, rather than risk losing the individuals with really strong data skills to the more typical data science careers. We can expand the way we measure success for graduate students and early career scientists. We know that number of publications is considered one of the big pr predictors of success. In their paper earlier this year, Ross et al. found that women are significantly less likely to be attributed as authors for the work they do. So this is just one example of the way this measure of success could be harming some scientists, especially from underrepresented groups and early in their careers. It also fails to acknowledge the work put into managed data, share interoperable data with other scientists and publish data and metadata. We can look to expanding our measures of success for those earlier in their careers to include those data intensive efforts so we aren't disadvantaging the individuals doing the work. Even when you have the skills to publish your data, it could be difficult to get funders to pay for that time. While this is definitely turning around and funders like NSF are being more explicit about data management and openness of data, we need that shift across the entire community so that we value the data skills and time involved just as much as we value the other parts of the scientific process. Two minutes left. Thanks. Biodiversity data science is full of these really great big ideas around fair data, the digital extended specimen, and open science and open data. But those can be really hard to wrap your head around if you're a brand new scientist in this field. I can personally attest to being welcomed into conversations on these topics, which has been great, but it often requires some homework to catch up because I never learned the lead up to those high level conversations. If we support the critical training from the start, which involves knowing how to design and manage data, work collaboratively and publish data, we can create an on-ramp into biodiversity data science. This gives us the opportunity to have early career scientists in these conversations, and they can bring in the perspective of someone without the expertise who wants to be involved and do the work and just needs to know where to start. That way we can make sure that the tools we're creating are going to work for everyone needing to use them. One minute. The changing landscape of education and science as we become more data focused and globally minded gives us a really great opportunity to support inclusion and accessibility. 
When we're training the 21st century workforce and looking toward future biodiversity science careers, we want to be engaging everyone, including those who historically haven't had the opportunity. We're working toward this through our open education resources in multiple formats and languages, openly acknowledging historical exclusion, representing diversity among scientists in our training materials, and opening up access to science regardless of background and ability level. Continuing to be intentional about these, about inclusion, diversity, and accessibility will be really critical on our path toward our shared goals of open science and open data. And thank you all very much for listening. Uh, great job, Sarah, keeping on time. Uh, so next uh, we have Nikki, Nikki Nicholson and uh, While Nikki gets set, um, Libby Elwood has joined us remotely. So has uh, Josna just, Pandey. Uh, so they are the uh, actual organizers of the session. Hello. <laughs> cool. Thanks very much. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, some work I've been doing with a, a colleague from Q. I'm Nikki. I work in biodiversity informatics at Q. It's a collaboration with one of my colleagues who's a taxonomist in the accelerated taxonomy department. And it's both about the tool that we've built and the process we've used to build it. So it's open science tools, hands on creation of a digital extended specimen. So how we can include a lot of people in this process too. So I'll start with a bit of context though. So a bit about me, if you will excuse me. Then I transitioned from software development into research. And something I've been really keen on as part of that transition is how we can use software development practices as we manage research. So these are things like automation, revision control, um, dependency management, and continuous integration. So these are things that we can help. Uh, we can take them across from software development. They can help us perhaps make the research process uh, a little more efficient, a little more understandable, replicable, and, and help people understand what we're doing as we're doing the process of research. So that's my interest at, at a personal level. But within my organization at Q, then we've also got this institutional commitment to use digital technologies. So that's my contribution to this, to this project to accelerate the process of taxonomy. And that's Eve's contribution to the project. So it's something we've been working on over the past, uh, past few months. Um, and thinking more widely about the context in which we're working. So thinking above my personal motivations and thinking above the institutional motivations, as a community aim, we want to build something like the digital extended specimen. So that we know if we stitch together specimens and the associated data around them, we're gonna be able to answer much more wide ranging questions and pull together data from many different research infrastructures. But how we do that is, uh, is probably going to involve activities at a really wide range of scales. So we can do large scale computational activities at the, at the aggregator level. So we can run machine learning algorithms that group together specimens like we've seen with the GBIF clustering process. But I think, and the focus of this talk is, I think there's also a role for distributed lightweight tools so that researchers can be really hands on about the links and the, the things that we're proposing to do with the specimens and, and link them to resources that are available. And I also think this is worth us trying because the more informed the researchers are about the, the direction that we want to want to take in, in building these kind of sometimes quite abstract ideas like the digital extended specimen, the more informed they're going to be about like making sure that we're going in the right direction. So the, the work that we've been doing is based on, uh, on an existing tool. I can't remember in my list of software development practices that I said take across, but one of them should have been reuse. So we're tr really trying to reuse software tools rather than uh, be terribly macho and build everything ourselves. So Obsidian is uh, something that's come along over the past couple of years. I've used it for about 18 months or so, which for a, for a cool tool, lasting 18 months for me is quite a good one. You know, normally I try things and then throw them away after a month. Um, and it's a personal knowledge manager, so it's there for you to create and link research notes. It's got a nice user interface that really emphasizes linking. But the key feature that I would, I would point 
you at is that the data you create are stored locally and they use open formats. So this means the work that you build in this tool um, sits in Markdown, which is a open text file format, which is pretty future-proof. You can build your research environment here. You don't have to worry about a commercial provider being bought up and your data disappearing. And you don't have to worry about maybe a colleague's research project getting follow-on funding for you to be able to get at your data in the future. Coupled with using local data formats, um, the tool works offline, which uh, in my conversations with colleagues about the, the working or not of Wi-Fi around different areas of the queue estate and working in the field and working in different places, uh, that's really important too. It's got an extensible architecture, so it's got plugins for data access, and it's got an active user and developer community. So they're a nice list of attributes. And if I highlight a few, we could say that they're also shared by a tool that we've adopted with a lot of success in our community, which is Open Refine. So one of, one of the aims of this project is to examine if we can make the step change in the management of unstructured or semi-structured research data and democratizing the way that we link that data and share it the same way that we've kind of democratized data cleaning with, with Open Refine. And to that end, we have extended Obsidian for specimen research. So I've written a bunch of plugins that access data resources like GBIF, uh, names from the International Plant Names Index, institutional profiles from GRCycle, also from GBIF, uh, people from Bionomia, and literature from Crossref. And we can uh, enable researchers to stitch all those data together. Um, they can cite those, uh, those elements in their new work. And they're kind of learning the processes of, of open science as they go. Um, we're using open formats and we're using open data as we go. So I've next got a really quick demonstration. If you were to download this software, you'd get a nice long worked example, and I'm going to rattle through it really quickly. So if anyone wants to see this later, just, just get in touch or perhaps put something up in the unconference session. So you'll download it and you'll get this uh, welcome page. And if I, is it going to play? Oops, <laughs> perhaps it won't play with this. Sorry about this. Um. Can you play? Okay, so you re really will have to catch me later. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No, 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 it's not there at all. Yep. No, it's not, it's not there in the sound, no. Yeah, okay. So uh, you would be able to highlight a plant name and send that plant name to IBNI. You'd get a data response from IBNI which is then templated into uh, markdown and structured data format, uh, structured front matter, which is uh, YAML metadata. So you get a representation of an external object in your local research environment. The data you get from IPNI is, uh, holds the type specimen. So you'd be able to highlight a type specimen as in the collector name and number, send that to GBIF, get, uh, get the record back from GBIF, which would include all the Darwin core elements of the record, again, templated and a zoomable specimen image. You could highlight elements of that record, say the institution code, send it to GR cycle, the person name, send it to Bionomia. Um, jumping back to IPNI, if you grabbed the DOI, you'd be able to send it to Crossref, bring all those data back. Basically the ROD's biodiversity <laughs> knowledge graph, uh, our researchers can build these on their desktop. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry that doesn't work. Uh, but yeah, grab me later and we'll go through it. Um, I've also linked my research manager to this so you can annotate and view PDFs within it. So I'm, I'm happy to fix this and show people later if, if you would like. 
So the, the roadmap that, um, that we've been working to is a personal research environment. And that's what I would have shown you if, uh, if I hadn't um, blown up quite so badly there. So this is based on markdown authoring all local for, for a researcher. But we see this developing in a number of ways. So we're building markdown, which is linked up together. So we could build static sites off of that. So if, if someone wants to publish their research to their colleagues, then we'll look at using something like GitHub Pages, which is pretty easy for someone to, to bring up a website, thank you, um, to, to publish their work and for their colleagues to be able to look at it. We're also looking at document production. So templated documents, citation of specimens and generation of documents out, out of this system and eventually data set production. So the links between the data items are probably the most valuable thing. They've been created by experts in context. So we should be able to mobilize these data out. And finally, about the way that we are doing the work. I'm part of an open science mentoring scheme called Open Life Sciences. What this does is it really emphasizes the way we work in science, um, how we build projects for inclusivity, accessibility and sustainability. And they're a really great bunch of people. And if any of you are interested in joining the next cohort, applications will start in January. So again, uh, yeah, just uh, grab me in a break and talk about it. And we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Yes. So next, we're going to have a presentation by Solane Theo Carides. Uh, is that the right way? Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, is there a... Okay. Uh, hi there, folks. My name is Sue, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the persistent identifier infrastructure for DISCO. Sorry. Uh, so DISCO, in case you haven't heard about it yet, is the Distributed System of Scientific Collections. Uh, it's a planned infrastructure that will be linking uh, will be linking specimen data across Europe. Uh, these data will be coalesced into what we're calling digital specimens. Uh, these are essentially these are essentially uh, digital surrogates for a physical object. Uh, it'll also contain planned derived terms for a um, will contain derived terms uh, such as trait information and genomic information. Uh, so a persistent identifier or PID, if you're trying to save time can be described as a unique string or name uh, and associated metadata that allows us to unambiguously describe an object. So let's talk a bit about what that means and how it works. So first I'm gonna talk about the name structure. So names or the unique string um, uh, allow us to uniquely identify a digital object. This is an example of a handle name uh, which has a prefix and a suffix. Uh, handles are a type of persistent identifier that we are uh, implementing in DISCO. So the prefix here is typically assigned to a institution or other PID issuing authority. Um, and the suffix is unique underneath that prefix and identifies a specific record. Uh, this is the PID, the handle prefix. Um, assigned to DISCO, and this gives you an idea of what our suffixes are going to look like. So that is uh, around eight characters, possibly nine, separated by a slash alphanumeric. But a PID is more than just a unique string. It also needs to contain associated metadata that allows us to, one, find the object, and two, provide enough information for machines to make decisions without having to resolve it. 
So this is an example of a PID record in the handle system. It contains the location of the object, as well as other useful information, like who issued the PID and the date it was issued. So we want our PIDs to have three qualities. We want them to be resolvable. This means that the PID constantly needs to point to the correct location of the digital object. It also needs to be, unsurprisingly, persistent. If our digital object moves, it needs to, the PID record needs to be updated to point to the new location. If the digital object is deleted, then that PID record cannot be deleted. Instead, it needs to be updated to point to a tombstone record and that, which describes what happened to the resource. Finally, it needs to be informative. So this means that the PID record needs to contain machine actionable information so that it doesn't have to resolve every time. We will be having a lot of digital objects in Disco. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technology that we're using to achieve these three goals. First, the handle system, which I alluded to earlier, is a global distributed infrastructure that people use to mint, manage, and resolve PIDs that are called handles. Uh, the infrastructure can be broken down into two broad components, the global handle registry or GHR and local handle services, which um, are typically overseen by institutions or other PID issuing authorities. So when a handle is being resolved, uh, the global handle registry handles the request. It looks at the prefix and redirects the request to the appropriate local handle service. That service then looks at the suffix, finds the correct record, and returns the location of the digital object. Now, the handle system is a robust infrastructure, but it does lack the policy that we need for persistent identifiers. Specifically, it is really easy to delete a handle. So all of a sudden, our persistent identifiers feel a lot less persistent. Uh, that's where the DOI Foundation comes in. So the DOI Foundation, uh, Digital Object Identifier Foundation, essentially uses the handle infrastructure, the handle resolution system to resolve handles, sorry, to resolve PIDs while enforcing a regulatory framework that prevents deletion and ensures persistence. There are checks and balances in place to ensure that PIDs are not deleted under the DOI system, even if the issuing authority is removed or retired. Um, there's a little bit of confusion sometimes, the difference between a DOI and a handle all you need to know is that all DOIs are handles, not all handles are DOIs. So within DISCO, digital specimens will have DOIs. Other non-public facing objects will be likely, uh, handles will be sufficient. Now, the DOI Foundation provides templates for PID records, um, but these are not entirely sufficient for our needs and will not help machine actors make the decisions that we want them to make. So to address this, we are making our own PID record metadata schema. So essentially describing all of the terms important for a PID record. Uh, you can see some of the terms here. This is the first part of our schema. Um, and these will apply to all objects within DISCO. Now this schema is being uh, developed in consultation with Tadwig, the Fair Digital Object Forum, and the DOI Foundation. We're also working with the DOI Foundation to make sure that key terms are represented in our schema while still developing something that meets our needs. This is to ensure interoperability with other DOIs. So this will be all uh, digital objects in DISCO, handles and DOIs. But for more complex objects, we have a couple other things that we want to see. So the blue terms are key terms already uh, required for DOIs. Uh, orange terms, or the second tier, uh, our data, our metadata terms required for digital specimens. And the third tier here, um, our metadata specific for botany specimen, which is a subtype of digital specimen. This is cumulative, so uh, all digital specimens will require the DOIs. Um, and those terms, all the DOIs will require the terms in the previous slide and so on. So we're working with the community to develop uh, and identify these subtypes of digital specimen, stuff like botany specimen or mycology specimen. Uh, these conversations are still ongoing, but what we want is to create, to tailor make these profiles for these subtypes to ensure that we're getting the most efficient use of our information and our schema. 
So to summarize, I've shown how we are achieving our goals of resolvability, persistence, and information using the handle system, the DOI foundation, and our own PID record schema. I hope I have resolved any questions you have about our PID schema. And I would just like to thank these folks for their work on the PID schema within DISCO and DISCO as a whole. Thank you. Oops. Great job, Sue, except for taking the mic with you. <laughs> but that was good. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Michael Elliott. I, I'm really pleased to see young people presenting at this session and doing such a great job. So we should save a hand for them at the end here. Not that the exclusion of the other presenters, of course. <laughs> Oh, sure. Is this the clicker? Cool. Yes. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael from the University of Florida. Um, and I'm going to be presenting on signed citations, making citations of digital scientific content persistent. Um, this is some work I've been doing with Jorit Polin and Dr. Jose Fortes um, for the past few years. So I thank them very much for all their contributions. Um, so every great presentation starts with something in a nutshell. So I thought I would. Um, so my problem in a nutshell is that citing digital content is easy. Um, because if it's on the internet, if you found it on the internet, it had a URL, you can cite that URL and someone will be able to find it at least temporarily. The problem is that keeping citations persistent is hard because if we're using internet-based locations for our data, um, the internet is always changing. The data can always move or be deleted. Um, and if you're wondering what that scribble is, I had an image of a nutshell there but I was not sure what the license was. And I read that cautionary tale that was sent to us where we could be charged a lot of money for using the wrong license. So I drew you a nutshell. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna approach this a little bit backwards. I'm just gonna show you what we do and then explain why we do it. Um, so here is just sort of a traditional citation of an image. Um, you see it's from the Museum of Comparative Zoology, um, Harvard University, and it's titled a head frontal view of this specimen, and it's a bee specimen. Um, and you can see I've included a URL there, so that's the location that the image was found. The image didn't have like a DOI or anything, but typically you'd use something more persistent like that. And you can see we made this citation um, sometime last year. So yeah, if you click on that location, you'll see this image, nice headshot of a bee. So let's call it bee.jpg. Um, so what we're gonna do is turn, try to turn this citation into what we call a signed citation. Um, so something that rather than citing the location of the content actually cites the location itself. I mean, the, sorry, <laughs> the opposite of that, the content itself um, directly. So we take, b.jpg, and we input it into what's called a cryptographic hashing algorithm. Um, we chose the SHA-256 hash, um, but there are a bunch of different algorithms that would be perfectly acceptable. And when you put the image or any digital file, it, it, just, it just has to be a string of ones and zeros on a computer. If you put it into the algorithm, it spits out what's called a hash. Um, so content hash b.jpg, this SHA-256 algorithm specifically outputs a 256-bit hash. So the hash of a file is always going to be the same size. Um, there, right, there are only about 64 characters because it's using hexadecimal encoding, but there are 256 bits in that string. So we take that and we put it into the citation. 
but the hash alone is not super useful because you need to know how the hash was created. So we prefix the hash with something that tells us this identifier is a hash and we use the SHA-256 hashing algorithm to compute it. And we call the combination of the hash algorithm name and the hash the content signature. So the idea is that this content signature is uniquely mapped to whatever content was used to produce it. Um, so the image here, this B, will always produce that exact hash, no matter what, no matter who computes it, no matter when, as long as you're using that exact image that I used. And this particular format is called a hash URI. Um, there's a specification online detailed at that website. And when we include a content signature into a citation, we call it a signed citation. So just to clarify that the citation is signed by the content, not by like a human, not using any kind of notary or protocol or anything. It's just purely by the content. So what does this actually do? Why, why do we do this? Um, <laughs> so first off, I'm gonna list a few benefits. Um, the first one is verification. So there's two different ways a citation can break. The first one is called link rot, and this also applies to identifiers. Um, just calling a citation something, a, a list of identifiers perhaps. Um, so link rot occurs when a citation cannot be resolved to the thing that was cited. So if somebody's reading your paper and you cited some data, if the user cannot find the data from your citation, we say link rot has occurred. The other problem is called content drift. So this happens when somebody trying to use your citation finds the wrong data um, and they may or may not realize it. So link rot is easy to catch. If you can't find something, it's pretty obvious you were supposed to find something. Um, content drift often goes unnoticed. So if you're trying to find the data somebody cited, you might find a new version, but you might not realize you're using something a little bit different from what the original authors used. So with hashes, so oh yeah, first off, uh, common citation methods lack precise verification information. And this goes pretty much generally for everything. So whether it's a URL or a DOI or anything, they don't really give you any mechanism to make sure that what you retrieve is what you expected. So that's what content signatures are for. And they've been used for this purpose for a long time outside of citation, just to verify that you are, you have exactly what you thought that you were supposed to have. And the way that they do this is somebody, uh, the citation will provide a content signature. You'll download the data and then recompute the content signature. If when you compute matches the one that was cited, you know you have the right thing. Benefit two is unique identification. So the cryptographic hashes, so these content signatures are, there's a, there's a one to one mapping between a hash and content. Um, and there are st statistical guarantees. If, if you're using a, a complex enough algorithm or a long enough hash, you can statistically guarantee that no other digital content will ever have that same hash. It's just in, infeasible, impractical to ever find another digital object that has a, or digital content that would produce that same hash. So you kind of get a free unique identifier that requires zero infrastructure or orchestration or social coordination of any kind. Um, so nobody needs to make sure that identifiers don't overlap or that two identifiers aren't assigned to the same thing. And uh, another benefit of that is two different people working maybe completely different sides of the globe, I have no idea who each other is. Um, they can both arrive at the exact same identifier if they're using the same data. And I'll have to speed through these quickly. Um, they're content-based, so the location of the thing doesn't matter. If, if somebody says they got this image from mcz.harvard.edu, which is where we did get it from, um, and then I find that the image is also in Zenodo, that content signature will cite both of them, even if the Zenodo record didn't exist yet when I first made the citation. 
Um, and I have to skip a little bit. Um, so content hashes can be made resolvable, just like DOIs, just like any kind of persistent ID. All you need is a public registry um, that says, if you give it a hash, it'll give you the location of the content associated with it. Um, and the cool thing about registries for hashes is they're completely decentralized. Anybody can make a registry um, and they can tell you any location they want, no matter where it is. So there's no central, there's no handle system. Like you can use any system you want. We call them robust because they're resistant to link around content drift. Sorry, I have to go fast. <laughs> um, if, a, if a location rots, another one may be available. So link right at one location associated with an identifier does not necessarily cripple the use of the identifier um, as a citation. And if one location serves the wrong content, you can catch it and try another location if you can find one. So the point is that these are great for persistence because if the identifier fails to resolve for whatever reason, it can always be fixed as long as somebody somewhere in the world has a copy of the data you were looking for. It can always be repaired and resolution can always be restored. And we call that persistence. Um, okay, so another, we, we can, if you wanna <laughs> talk about this stuff, we can uh, do a one-on-one. -on -one. So I'll skip through this, but the recap is that New stuff needs new standards. So there's a lot of different community involvement that would be required to make this more widespread. Um, thanks for listening. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, next time I'll turn on the high-speed switch uh, before you talk. But uh, <laughs> uh, Laura Slaughter is next. Yeah. I do. I think yeah. I'm back. <laughs> It's already open. Uh, if you just click on that uh, PDF, it'll be on the bottom. It's already open. There. Yeah, that's it. Like this. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm ready. Uh, so um, I'm Laura Slaughter. And I work at the University of Oslo in the informatics department. Um, my colleague, Life Herald, also works with me in the informatics. And uh, co author Evelina is at the Norwegian Biodiversity Data Center. Uh, and the fourth uh, author here, Martin Sheveland, is also in informatics with, with me. Uh, and today's talk is about uh, something that we've been working on with the Biodiversity Data Center project. Uh, and in this project, I'm specifically going to talk about uh, something called reusable ontology modeling patterns um, with the biodiversity data uh, using something called Otter, um, reasonable ontology templates. That's what Otter stands for. Okay, so who are we? Um, I am from the ontology engineering group and domain adapted data science at the University of Oslo. Um, we work with semantic technologies, modeling languages, semantic mapping tasks, data integration, ontologies, knowledge graphs, and we have projects from many different domains. So this was new to me. Um, it's taken me a while to like understand fully some of the issues. Um, but Evelina has done a great job of explaining them. Um, uh, so, but I've learned a lot from being here. And um, so we were brought in to work on uh, the development of a new trade bank at the Norwegian Biodiversity Data Center. So um, this trade bank uh, will be used to store information about trades, and connect them to habitats and species information. 
yeah, so what are the challenges here and why do I have this distraught looking uh, ec ecologist looking person here on the screen? And this is something that we experience a lot in working with domain experts. Um, you know, they uh, are introduced to the idea of building a knowledge base, but then end up completely confused, you know, looking at these um, uh, all different kinds of ontologies that have been developed and then ending up with this tool that you see uh, sort of hidden in the background called Protege. I don't know if how many of you have actually seen this or used it, but it's actually quite, I think, quite difficult for domain experts to, to learn this. Um, so what we had here are some challenges. Uh, how to represent traits, what are these? Um, yeah, how to automatically, for example, set spe uh, species status, um, whether they should go to red list or alien uh, species list, uh, explore ontology reuse, um, explain how to build a knowledge base and how to use knowledge-based uh, data integration. Uh, and to find a clever way to help domain experts work with thematic technologies and build the trade bank. So um, we have many tools at our disposal that we develop in our department, in our research group. And one of the tools that we have is called Otter. Um, so Otter is a framework and a language which we have uh, developed for formally representing and instantiating ontology modeling patterns. And it's designed to support knowledge-based construction and interaction at a higher level of abstraction. So, I mean, our main principle is like, don't repeat yourself. So, um, why why would you keep, uh, yeah, um, yeah, constantly typing the same patterns? So, um, so it's a solution for repetitive and tedious ontology construction tasks. If you try to capture these modeling patterns, it make it also easier for ontology maintenance. So this makes it easier for the domain expert to construct parts of an ontology because they don't have to look at L, they don't have to look at RDFS. Uh, basically, you have someone who knows these things, who writes the templates, and then the domain expert can easily uh, instantiate the templates given the, the spreadsheets and databases that they use every day. And um, I'm going to try to go over this in a nutshell. Um, so um, ontology engineers, or they, um, yeah, people who have uh, learned OWL can have a domain expert who is actually an ontology engineer in the sense that they've learned uh, logical statements and they've learned how to write OWL uh, axioms. And um, so they would know how to uh, write these sort of statements, right? Um, uh, which is, uh, I, I gave two examples here uh, for uh, wingspan as a trait, um, just trying to show what this uh, would look like, but that um, what we're always looking for is we're looking for patterns. So let's say you have uh, wingspan as a trait and you have 30 different types of wingspan traits. So for each trait, you have many ways to measure it. Um, how would you add this to your triple store? Oh, there goes my thing. Oh, it came back. <laughs> Good. Um, can a domain expert do this without becoming a protege expert? Uh, so there you see a picture of this uh, ontology engineer. That's me um, at my desk um, authoring templates. And this is an example of a template uh, written with uh, other um, language. And um, here we have an example of a wingspan template. And what I basically say here is that very simple. Um, if you create a new wingspan, it's a class and it will have uh, some definition. And then the second line, I say that this wingspan, it will be a subclass of trait. Um, and I have defined trait as a class elsewhere. So templates are modular. Uh, and then I will say that, okay, um, you will also create this uh, triple, the name of that class with the label, uh, some string definition. So you write the template uh, and we have also a tool which will uh, instantiate that and expand it to RDF um, when it's been populated. And how do you populate it? 
Right, we have different tools here. We have something called tab butter and we have something called butter. Um, so you can connect to a database directly. Uh, you can correct, uh, we have a tab butter to connect to spreadsheets. So the domain expert doesn't need to know how to write logical axioms. They can just use their familiar tools. You can also create your own pipeline. Uh, there's uh, another format that you can use to instantiate your template. So here we have uh, three examples, which is fill in that template, insect uh, wingspan, bird wingspan, bat wingspan, and some definition. I made this up, you know, so I'm not an expert um, on uh, biodiversity here. Uh, so for more details on uh, Otter, uh, just take a look at our website, uh, which is um, otter.xyz. We have a lot of tutorials, demonstrations, and then we have a web, web version of Lutra, uh, which you can test out. So we have uh, multiple serialization formats, Stutter, which is a compact uh, serialization format for Otter, uh, which is uh, aimed to be easy to read and write. Okay, I've got to go fast, so you'll have to go to the website. Um, so now we've um, combined Semantic Media Wiki with Otter. So we have a group that has created an extension to Semantic Media Wiki uh, to use the Otter templates directly into, in Semantic Media Wiki. So this makes it easy for your domain expert to add to your ontology, to add knowledge to your knowledge base, and they can add their data. Um, as well. So this makes it uh, easier to reuse the ontology and the data uh, and easier data integration. So we have a happy uh, butterfly researcher here who wants to add a new butterfly wingspan measurement to the trade bank. Uh, there are many ex um, advantages to using Semantic Media Wiki with Otter. Um, so it's uh, easily accessible to domain users. Uh, the wiki can be searched using the semantic search um, in that's built in, uh, and you can also output the data. Um, it's a nice format. We've tested this out. Uh, the other extension was developed in Bielefeld, Germany. Um, the responsible for this is Basil L. He works 50% with us and 50% in Bielefeld. And what you see here is just an example of uh, his testing with material scientists. Um, and so they've created many templates and the material science uh, scientists are busy instantiating them and creating their own knowledge base for their purposes. But we've recreated this um, for the biodiversity data center. So here you see um, a happy ecologist who wants to um, add their own um, butterfly wingspan measurement um, so basically what they do is they just go to Semantic Media Wiki, they find out, oh, there's a template that's already been made by me. Uh, and you can use the Semantic Media Wiki forms to fill this out. You create your own identifier, your own description. And what they don't know is that basically what's happening under the scenes is that they've created a new class for that method and a new definition. So that's it. Uh, in my talk has disappeared, but that's the talk. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Yeah. And uh, next we have uh, Frank Mikkel. Frank Michel. Sorry. Uh, Is it correct? Yes. Okay. And the remote, you left with the remote. Ah. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's the point, point one, this one. Okay. Uh, Thank you and hello everyone. So um, in this presentation, I would like to share with you the results of a, a research project called ESA in which our goal was to help make open scientific archives more fair. Uh, so just to start a few uh, motivations at the origin of this project, uh, we'll witness the fact that um, articles are being published ever faster in conferences, articles or as preprints. 
And um, that makes bibliographic search pretty difficult. It's difficult to make sense of all that, of that mass of knowledge and sometimes just find the articles that would be relevant for your own research or find some cross-disciplinary articles. And um, in this landscape, the scientific archives have a very central role to play, in particular the open archives, that is those who favor the open access to publications. The problem is that quite frequently those archives come with search systems that are rather limited, that is they provide string-based search which fails to grasp the, the connections, the relationships between the articles, uh, or they can rely on the keywords of the of the author keywords, but which are really somehow limited. Uh, so in the biodiversity context, we have examples of uh, very rich search services, but which are most generally based on taxonomic search. And we can think it, that we can go uh, to a broader type of search. Uh, so in the end, we can try to find some, to figure out some smarter tools to exploit this mass of knowledge. So that's the ob objectives of uh, the ESAP project in which we want to propose a solution for, to help uh, researchers make searches in open scientific archives in a way that's gonna be generic, which means it's independent of any research topic or community. It's reusable, so we can transfer it from one archive to the other with rather limited adaptation and possibly extens extensible. We provide it with a set with a pipeline, but there, there, there are many other things that we could do, and it's meant to be extensible. So how we did that? Uh, well, the, the process is rather natural. The first thing is that we use existing uh, machine process. Uh, 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 text processing algorithms to extract rich metadata from the ar articles of an archive. Uh, and we turn this into a semantic index that we publish on the web of data as a linked data set uh, according to FAIR principles. We link this to general purpose vocabularies or domain specific vocabularies that in that case depend on the community. Uh, and uh, uh, on top of that, we want to provide some search and visualization tools that help you make sense of that content. And uh, in the course of the project, we used uh, an existing institutional archive as a use case, which is AgriTrap. It's uh, an archive based, uh, specialized in agronomy and development. Um, so I'm not going to get into the details of the pipeline itself, but just to, to give you a flavor of what we've, we've been doing. So this is a regular article that you can find in, in this archive. The first thing we do is to run machine processing, uh, machine learning algorithms to extract thematic descriptors. So when I say descriptor, I mean uh, keywords or terms from a vocabulary that can characterize the article as a whole. Uh, and in that case, we want to use some domain specific algorithm uh, vocabularies. So we can link those thematic descriptors to the vocabulary of your choice. So uh, here you can see a set of, of keywords that we have extracted. They are related to AgroVoc uh, in our case because that, that was the domain of activity of the, of the AgriTrop Open Archive. Um, second thing, we run some other types of processing to extract named entities. That is mentions in the full text of the article of any kind of things that you can disambiguate with existing vocabulary. So we used as a base Wikidata and Dbpedia, which are general purpose vocabularies. And again, we reused Agrivoc because, because that was the main topic of that archive. But again, you could use any other vocabulary and train a system to find the named entities with, with the, that specific vocabulary. Uh, we also use geonames so that we can get the figure out which ones or which names entities are geographic entities and then get from geonames the coordinates and, and other information. Okay, so once we have done that for all the articles of the archive, uh, we have a data set that we publish on the web using linked data principles, and then we can start doing a bit more fancy stuff. So we have three uh, user interfaces. I will show two of them, which are the most interesting. The first one is about descriptors association rules. So remember descriptors, these are these terms from a vocabulary <clears throat> sorry, uh, that describe, that characterize the article as a whole. The association rules are something like, if an article has a descriptor A, then very likely it is also going to have another descriptor B with a certain probability. And that's what we, we do. We, we compute that with stat basic statistical, statistical methods. And this interface is a visualization of those rules. So those diamond-shaped things in the middle are the rules. 
And here I have entered on the top, top left uh, the climate change mitigation term from Agrovoc. And that interface tells me that there is one rule that says if an article has the descriptor climate change mitigation and sorry, forests, then very likely it will also have a descriptor carbon sequestration. Uh, then you can get the list of the articles that do match that rule and so on. So that first tool is quite well adapted, we think. Yeah. Uh, for the discovery of uh, associations that may not be that may not be that obvious. So typically you may be able to discover a new research hypothesis uh, with this kind of tool. The other one is meant to explore networks of entities throughout the archives. Entities are articles, authors, research topics, taxonomic groups, that can be anything. Uh, and here is, here is an example. I'm looking for all the articles that do mention the, the concept health or any of its subconcepts. Here, this is an extract of the Thesaurus Agrovox. So there are many subconcepts of health. And that's when we start like that. So the graph view, in, in this graph view, the green dots are health subconcepts. The orange dots are any other concept that are co-mentioned in the article. So I fly over one of those, which is uh, environmental impact. And then I can open another view, which is called the egocentric view, where, yes, where I see this concept connected to the other health subconcept. And I can have an ID with that, that blue bar gives me an idea of the number of articles concerned by this co this, this co-occurrence. Co and I can get the list of articles and their distribution throughout the time and so on and so on. So the nice thing with that tool is that it is very flexible. It's basically just configured with a Sparkle query in which you search whatever you like. So that's you who decide what is the network that you're, you're going to show. Uh, you could decide to show networks of publications with co-authors or networks of uh, public policies uh, co-mentioned with a certain uh, taxonomic group of species and so on. Um, now, uh, in the few, well, in, in the next steps, um, so you have seen that, maybe you have seen that presentation yesterday, that, that's Rod Page who presented this, this concept of a biodiversity knowledge graph. We're very much in line with this, with this ID and what we provide with the ESA project could be something that can clearly complement that, bio, that biodiversity knowledge graph and be, be a part of it. So, um, sorry. So I'm not a biologist, I'm, I'm a computer scientist. So I have just tried to figure out which are the kind of, of questions that you guys may have, but you guys are the most, uh, yeah, the, the most appropriate ones to figure out which are those questions. So I'm not sure these ones do make sense, that's on you. Uh, so for instance, what are the institutions that are most frequently mentioned together with certain taxonomic groups? So if we can link the ISA processing with taxonomic uh, registries, we can, uh, we can answer this kind of question. What are the research topics that frequently co-occur with climate change? Then you can ask, what is the distribution of these topics throughout the years? That is, is there a peak of, for some topics and so on? how public policies, uh, what are the public policies that usually occur in articles that mention some sort of maybe endangered species. These are just very, again, basic examples of what that could be. You guys may have much clever idea to, to use that, but this is the kind of things we can do. So we hope that can be interesting for the community. Uh, here are a few pointers and uh, down here, this is a, an article that we've published in ISWC, well, in November. Uh, where you can find many more details. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Frank. So uh, last but not least, um, we have the last presentation and uh, Theodore. Maybe Joe. 
Hello. Uh, I just want to present you the open BioDiff knowledge graph, the rebuilded version. So what is open BioDiff? Bio, open BioDiff is a complex system of uh, tools and workflows uh, that is built on the corpus of XML documents published in uh, our publishing platform ARFA and the other source of information is also the treatments coming from a uh, Platy treatment bank. So on the top of this XML corpus of data, uh, we try to build uh, another semantic layer. So the, the knowledge, the, the, the whole ecosystem of tools consists of uh, extraction scripts that convert this XML to RDF, the ontology, uh, which is, uses the open biology of ontology, which is uh, actually the, the bridge between the existing ontologies describing the structure of a scientific article. But this one um, gives more perspective about the taxonomy part. Uh, and triple store, in our cases, we are uh, decided to go for uh, GraphDB. Uh, the full text articles are stored in, in a separate database. On the top of that, we have uh, Elastic Engine. And the whole, all this thing is wrapped in Kafka event streaming platform to be able to track uh, all the processes. So in this way, uh, the information which is contained in those articles and treatments uh, is made available through, through different um, uh, endpoints like SparkQL, uh, generic search, and the RESTful API. Also, on the top of these things can be can uh, can be built user-specific applications. So, uh, Dardi, uh, what kind of data you can you can find there? Basically, you can find RDF uh, statements converted from those XMLs, as I said, published in uh, in all the pencil journals and also coming from Platzi. Uh, but it is not restricted only to those sources. Uh, in general, all kinds of uh, scientific articles which are published in JATS uh, XML or more specifically using TaxPub XML schema can be processed to, through this uh, workflow. Uh, so the, as I said, the ontology follows the structure of uh, the taxonomic article and the one published in 2018, opened by the all the basically uh, added the missing link uh, between, between the uh, existing ontologies we, we already have and the one we need to, to use for uh, our exact purposes uh, in biodiversity. This is the schema of the different links which are created during the artificialization process of the XML articles. So as you can see, uh, there are a lot of links that could uh, be registered in, in, uh, in the open BioDiff. So the rebuilded version, this is the, the, uh, the, the schema of uh, the entire infrastructure, of the new infrastructure. Uh, so starting from the left, the, the sources uh, of XML articles and treatments can be uh, added to in the system to API endpoints. From this API, the documents goes to uh, RD, RDFing, uh, RDFization scripts. So these scripts using the ontology creates the different uh, RDF, RDF uh, statements. Uh, so one article can be processed 
uh, in parallel by different workers and the different parts of this article can be processed simultaneously. Uh, when all these workers do their job, the RDF for one article is built all together and then it is imported to the GraphDB triple store. Once imported there, automatically uh, some index are generated in Elasticsearch and in this way the information becomes available uh, also in a REST API on the top of which uh, easily can be built different applications like the website we have built. And uh, last but not least, the, the full text of this uh, separate elements is stored in a document database like MongoDB uh, from where this content can, can be uh, retrieved if needed. Important thing is that uh, we are assigning identifiers to the main data classes in the XMLs before artificialization. Uh, this is uh, the website itself as one of the user applications. It has a, a generic search where you can just type uh, something. And this text string is basically mapped to either a person or taxon name or article. And then you can, uh, you can find general information about this thing, like references or collaborators of this person. Uh, another user specific application is the literature exploration. Uh, its purpose is basically to find uh, a data class which is mentioned somewhere in the specific uh, section of the article. In this example here, uh, you can see I search for taxon name Carabos, and you can see all the mentions of this Carabos in the different articles. Uh, also on the on the right, you can see uh, a graph which represents uh, what kind of sections this uh, taxon name is mentioned, mo mostly in in reference in references. But the the good thing is that uh, thanks to the identifiers we assigned already in the XML, <clears throat> when you click here from this website, basically you can go to the exact place in the original article where this thing is mentioned. So basically you can refer back, not only to the article, but also the, to the exact place. Uh, another similar application, which is uh, actually extension of the previous one is the co-occurrences, where you can uh, search for, exa for example, you can search for a taxon name and you can say, I want, with this taxon name also to have a sequence mentioned in the same section. Uh, finally, uh, also a SparkQL endpoint is uh, available. So you can uh, answer to complex questions like the one mentioned here. Uh, we have gave a few examples. So basically you can go and use them and just tweak uh, the Spark uh, SQL using your taxon name or you can change something else and see what will be the results. Thank you for the attention. Okay, uh, this concludes the uh, presentation phase of this session. So I'd like to uh, ask you to give another hand to all the speakers and to our time controller. So now that you've been nice to the speakers, you can change into the not being so nice to the speakers and ask questions. So we're going to ask the folks in the room to walk forward and um, use one of the mics to ask a question and identify yourself the usual routine. And the folks uh, in virtual land, uh, please type your questions on chat. Um, so um, I have one question from chat that I'm going to read. And in, the, in, in that time, please think about questions here in the room and you can get up and, and walk forward. So a question from um, uh, Yorit 
uh, Poland to Nikki Nicholson. Uh, I can see how your example works for looking at the relatively small data set due to delay in web APIs and other associated network resources. How do you imagine working with relatively large data sets? And how do you imagine being able to reproduce results? So Nikki, where are you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Yorick. Yorick is online now, is he? Okay, so I'll, I'll repeat what I said in uh, chat. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question about performance and replicating results. So in terms of performance, um, I'm staying at a hotel with terrible Wi-Fi. And had you been able to see the, the video that I made, um, the APIs that I used were really performant. So I'd really like to send thanks to people at GBIF, Bionomia, the technical team and the editorial team behind it, the GR Cycle and Crossref. They all worked really well on really quite terrible Wi-Fi. Um, so they, they were well performant. I wouldn't say the GBIF data set of botanical preserved specimens is a small data set, but I was able to fire queries about against it and get, get performant results back. In terms of uh, revision controlling or versioning the, the data you look at, then also to support offline work, I'd like to have the plugins read local files. So you could make a download from GBIF. You've got a DOI associated with that. We know exactly what data was downloaded. And then you'd be able to reference that as you're, um, as you're building and linking together your specimens. Um, I'm following as a model the way that uh, a group of people have implemented a citation manager in Obsidian, which reads the output of your bibliographic manager as a, as a local bib text file. So it's perfectly possible for you to read data from your local machine as well as a web API. Um, thanks, Nikki. Any questions from the room? Thanks. Yes. Hello. Oh, hello. Uh, so I'm Josh Humphreys from Natural History Museum London. Um, I had a question for Michael about the hashing stuff. Uh, so as I'm sure you know, and as a computer scientist, my background, I know hash, you know, the production of a hash algorithm is incredibly easy to change. That's part of what hashing algorithms are for. Um, and I was slightly worried about the use of the term content signature. Um, versus something like a file signature, because the content is so easy to change in that file. Somebody could download that image and get a different hash because it's gone through somebody else's system and maybe some EXIF has been changed and they didn't realize, and then they get a different hash. And do they understand that and why it's happened? So I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that and how whether there's anything we can do to mitigate that kind of problem where the file looks like it hasn't changed, but because the hashing algorithms are so sensitive, it actually has. And yeah, whether we can do anything about that, because using hashes is fantastic. There's lots of advantages for it, but it also can create some complications. So yeah, I wonder if you had any thoughts. Sure, yeah, thanks for asking. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's a great question. So with hashes, like, like uh, most of the time, it's not like a super complicated route to get the data. Usually you get it, it comes intact. Um, errors are pretty rare in transmission. And then, I mean, that's one point of the hash. If, if it doesn't work, you can just keep trying again. It's, well, maybe it does work. Um, but as far as like getting processed through a few systems, then you get the data and maybe something was adjusted on the way. Um, I think that's part of standards, of, of standardizing things. If these hashes are used for resolution, then those kinds of touches along the way should be, you know, kept to zero <laughs> for the sake of hashing. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So one, one thing we've talked about is sometimes maybe you'd want to hash like a collection of data, but it's not in a particular order. But of course, the hashing algorithm is sensitive to the order in which the data comes. Um, usually we, we deal with that by just working with zip files and only, only considering single files. Um, but that would be requires some sort of maybe canonicalization of how do you hash collections of data um, or things that have been choked through a, a processing pipeline? So um, yeah, keeping things consistent is very important.
Any additional questions from either the chat or the room? Please. So it was for Quentin. I'm just not. Thank you. Um, yes. So um, obviously, it's Elspeth Haston from um, Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. Um, so obviously, we've got a strong interest in um, cultivated um, specimens, making sure that we can get them online and making sure people understand what they are. Um, I guess there's a there is a bit of a gradient there between cultivated and introduced and naturalized, and I just wondered if you wanted to kind of say something about how that. With the moment we just got two terms. Do we need more terms, or are there, are there enough? I only just showed those two terms, but there is a whole sequence of terms going all the way from completely naturalized all the way through to captive. Captive. So yeah, I just showed the two relevant terms for the for the uh, talk. That's all. <laughs> and I put in Slack the relevant papers, the paper we did on domesticated organisms, and the paper on the uh, vocabulary as well. I have a question from Michael, if I can ask. Please. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, Michael, can you can you hash uh, like PDFs and use those within citations in papers, for instance, so that you can say you definitely have the right PDF? I know I've been misattributed when I reviewed a paper. Uh, I've been misattributed to be the author of that paper, and would that help with that thing? Um, yeah, you you could definitely hash a PDF because um, I I know like. Obviously, how you see the PDF depends on the renderer and everything, but the thing being hashed is just the exact bits before any kind of processing was done on it. Um, and I, I'm i not aware of, because I know like with images, when you pass them around, sometimes compression happens and things um, and, and bits change and you, it's not detectable to the human eye, but it is to a hash. Um, I'm not aware of that happening so much for PDFs. Um, I don't know if there's a situation where I ever would have been tempted to check if that would be happening. Um, I would think it would be fine though. Um, the, the only thing that might be maybe an issue is, I mean, PDFs are kind of like printouts in a way, like a digital printout. Um, it could be possible that a, a paper could have been in like a word format or something or a Google doc, and then it got printed and it got printed from different places using or using different software. Like if you if you print a Word file using Word, and then if you print a Word file using Google Docs or something and their rendition of it, and maybe it would produce a different PDF. I'm not sure. So you might get slightly different, you know, representations of the underlying document. I don't know. Um, also, I know like sometimes maybe if you get a PDF, PDF, someone might have applied like a watermark or something depending on where you got it from, or I'm not sure. It's, yeah, something to think about. Yes, friend. Yeah, uh, I have a question for Lyubomir. I don't know where you are. Uh, Stuador, sorry. Uh, where are you? Ah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, there, there are quite some commonalities between what we've been doing in ESA and what you've been doing specifically on, on the biodiversity literature, which in your case is an archive. And I would, I'd be interested in knowing which kind of processing you're doing on the articles. I'm thinking in particular maybe taxonomic disambiguation. And on the other hand, on the other, uh, yeah, on the other hand, if uh, the visualizations I've presented would possibly make sense for you guys to uh, eventually integrate that into open uh, interface. Thank you. Um, so yes, the the disambiguation of the and the tagging of the taxon name we are doing in the XMLs. So we we already have uh, content with uh, structured content with uh, with some semantics added, and the goal here is to to make this content accessible also using different uh, different technologies and of course to uh, using these techno uh, different technologies we are able to create more links that are not obvious in the xml itself 
And that's the other advantages of, uh, of the things we try to do. Uh, and to, the other, to your other question about the, the visualization interface, uh, this is uh, just uh, an example which is trying to demonstrate uh, what, what you can find there. Basically, a simple application built on the top of, of the data, uh, which uh, we think will be useful because when you usually uh, the, the users uh, trying to find something and we decided that this uh, we were cool thing to to be able to to search for some, a certain thing uh, and to be able also to, to 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 narrow the scope and to say okay i want to find something which is uh, in a concrete section of the article not everywhere in the article and yeah this is the simplest representation we came up and also you, also, also you can download the results as a CSV if you want to use these identifiers further. Of course, of course. Uh, having, having the graph means that you can um, uh, basically um, connect with other graph databases and enrich the, the, the data. Thank you. Any other questions? Please, Rob. Yes, uh, Rob Harding from Naturalis, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, I have a question for uh, Nikki. Um, Nikki, are you not afraid that uh, with a tool like Obsidian, uh, you are promoting uh, researchers to store their data uh, locally and offline, uh, creating new nightmares? Uh, considering uh, uh, institutional data management and siloed uh, data? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, they're doing that anyway. So what I've shown you is the first step. It's really about um, kind of promoting best practices amongst researchers. And I think we can't expect them to make one big leap into the way they manage their research data. So um, at the moment, there's a scattering of Word documents and text documents and sets of bookmarks in people's browsers, um, things in like Pocket and Read It Later, uh, tweets that people have received and put in bookmarks and all this stuff. Um, and I say that because um, I'm guilty of that as much as anyone, really. Um, I've used a tool like uh, that I've shown, um, Obsidian, for my, for my own kind of management of my own data. And it really has cleaned up the way I've worked. So. Yeah, you could say it's a silo, but it's a small step towards cleaning up and understanding the best ways that you work with your data. And their future proof formats, they're, they're marked down in YAML. Institutionally, um, institutionally, we know we've got tons of data around in the kind of smattering of things I've just said there, plus access databases and Excel sheets and so on that get handed around to different people. And really what we want to do is promote people understanding the value of the data that they create as they create it, that it's not created on publication, that the, the things that they do with their data as they're exploring are really valuable too. And I think the better that we can build tools for people and sit down and learn about those with people then, then we'll be in a better place. If we shut our eyes to it, the, the problem is just going to continue with the Excel sheets and all the other things. So I think it's a step towards where we want to go. I'm not saying it's the it's the end at all. Do you, do you like it back? Any more takers? I'll, I'll have one for Frank and Theodore, both of them. So in, in your uh, very um, elaborate processes in name entity recognition and using rules to uh, match um, occurrences with uh, articles and so forth, um, you, you're going to get false positives and false negatives, I, I assume. 
Um, what do you have any measure of confidence on on your results? Uh, so the thing the the way we are basically matching uh, the taxonomic names, uh, we do basically two things. We are using uh, gazetteers. And all the names we 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 found in an article, we're trying to compare to different uh, external resources to be sure that they are actually exist. Uh, the other thing is that uh, it's a bit tricky because in the journals, uh, there are new taxonomic names described. So they are not in any nomenclators. So we have to, to use patterns to recognize those names. And uh, as you said, of course, in all cases, we, we get false positives. Uh, that's why at the end, we have a human curation for, for, curation for those uh, which are, let's say, uncertain to our own leaders. And how do you measure that uncertainty? Just to make uh, we actually we we don't we either uh, can verify that this is existing name or if not then we we check them thank you so on our side uh, there are two answers the first uh, we use some existing tools like um, entity phishing to disambiguate named entities with wikidata or dbpda spotlight so those tools well they have their own flaws and we just do with it. We don't do any additional measure because well, we, we don't have any, any way to improve it anyway. Uh, for the rest, we have trained some models to use in, in our case that was Agrovoc, but that could be another vocabulary. For now, we don't have clear measures of the, the amount of false positives, but that's obviously an issue. Uh, that's of course, mostly related to the training data. Um, so, but maybe an element of answer is uh, the problem may, may not be so much about false positives, but about noise. Because using common vocabulary, common algorithms, you're going to find entities about anything, like literally anything that you're probably very not concerned about. And that maybe is a bigger problem because you need at some point a way to filter your database so that you remove lots of trash, which is which may be correct, but that you just don't care about. And that, that's probably a, a bigger issue as for now than the false positives. Okay, folks, we have 20 minutes. Uh, great, okay, Deb. We can't put those two together when they're on. Hi, everybody. It's Deb. I am curious about two things. Answer whichever you choose. They're related. Um, I'm always interested in the unknown unknowns that people don't think to look for. And how can we reveal patterns in the data to help them go, aha. Elspeth, where are you? This is the G67 conversation. Backstory anytime you want it, we'll be happy to share it. Um, if I have a pile of data and you can present use cases, which you did, Theodore, the user wants to search for papers that contain this particular taxonomic name with this particular parasite or something. Um, but much like, I guess, an Amazon search where you're looking for something and it says, hey, you might also be interested in these things over here, right? I'm thinking about, one paper I read that was about questions that we have that might involve things like the, I don't know if the she's in here or not, the woman who gave the talk about the disease needing to be able to track parasites and hosts and to make some um, reasoning over the data for things like prediction and mitigation. So when you look at those big questions, you note that they require certain expertise. But then if you go and map authorship of papers, these authors publish on disease ecology, these authors publish on parasite issues, but this group of authors that publish over here and these over here don't publish in the same world. They don't, they don't intersect and they need to in order to answer those specific questions. And so I'm thinking about things like in your paper piles, can you make some graphs of 
authorship patterns that you see or don't see for given fields, for example. Or if I'm trying to discover patterns in the data, one example I can think of and how you would do this visually would be a project that was looking at patterns of suicide in the military and actually trying to understand if they increase over time or not, or if it was the social practices of hiding and renaming and couching what was really suicide as something else in order to hide the stigma associated with it, right? And so when you take the huge corpus of data and you study that data, you know, you need to look for words. We're talking about ontologies here, right? We're looking at patterns, how the words are expressed, how we can decide, okay, this term really meant this other thing, um, and then make some reasoning over time. So if I'm searching these giant piles of data, I'm a researcher and I know what I'm looking for. It's different from how can I play with this pile of data? How can we visualize what other patterns might be in there where I can learn something that I didn't necessarily think of? It's a hard question, but I, I, I can, the G67 to make it clearer was essentially, and you have to correct me when I get it wrong, else, but that indexing a huge corpus of data, finding terms, tokens. So it didn't have to necessarily just be one word. And out popped G67 in this huge pile of herbarium sheet index text data. Why is that there? Why do you have a million records and why is G67 in there? So it turns out it's a tiny little string at the bottom of this particular herbarium label that a particular collector used. Nobody really, really knows what the pattern at the bottom means, but it always ended in G67. Well, great. Now you have a giant pile of data. You never thought to look for that. You can click on G67 and it gives you a corpus. There you are. And it's all the same collector. Now you have a bunch of information. You collected records that you didn't know to collect by that pattern. So I'm wondering how your tools can help us do those kinds of things. Thank you for the story. I'm going to keep it away from that one. Good news is that uh, we have only seven minutes. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a tough one indeed. Um, maybe just a few elements of answer. Um, the two I've, I've, I've presented with, with association rules, this is, we are still at the beginning of that, but it looks really promising. The thing is, um, we have used it on a, on, on a base of articles of 12,000 articles uh, related to agronomy and development. And the, the people from the Institute who we worked with told us, oh, that's interesting. I was not expecting this, uh, and, and so on. So the, the problem is very about which vocabulary you use to annotate the articles, and is it rich enough to discover the things that you would like to discover? But if, if this is the case, and, and agrovoc in this sense is very interesting because it's not just about agronomy development. It, with the years, it has become a huge vocabulary about, well, pertaining to many things. And it's very interesting because it gives you some associations that you would not necessarily expect. So it, it can spur some sort of serendipity, you know. So that doesn't mean it's always right or interesting. And we have measures about the, the rules, about uh, measures of probability, but also of interestingness. Uh, so there is probably lots of work to do to refine this and make this uh, to, like I was saying, there is probably a lot of noise in that, which will not be interesting. And finding out the right information that you're looking for within that noise still remains a challenge. But I really think there are some, some interesting leads in there. And in this other uh, visualization I showed, we have a way I didn't show it to few clusters. So it's not the discovery of patterns, but you can, like we have a view of networks of articles and authors. And uh, when you click on an author, then you can have the cluster of all the other uh, people who have already published with that person. And you can subsequently open, uh, refine your visualization and you have a, a really a progressive exploration of, of your archive. So that's element of answers, hope it can help. Yeah, so basically you can you can achieve the same thing using the open bio diff. If you, if you type a person name, you can see all the collaborators. If you click, not only all the collaborators uh, did author work with, but you can see how many articles they have published together. So you can continue clicking on their names and browsing and browsing and browsing. Uh, and this is just the first step. Uh, so 
as a publisher, we, we would like to make the information accessible to other people that can, will be able to work with and trying to, to make this such a project that you mentioned uh, actually happened. Quentin, you have a question? My question was actually for Sarah Hansen, if she's not still online. Um, oh, she's here. Sorry. I'm right here, online. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, it was just, uh, I think many of us in the room uh, are involved in teaching um, biodiversity informatics. And uh, you're probably aware of the bid program as well, but the GBIF have been running about uh, mm -hmm. teaching biodiversity informatics uh, much more widely. And um, can you say anything about how to globalize your materials uh, to make them as available as possible to a global, global audience? Yeah, so so I think the like the bid project and I know I was talking with someone about carpentries. I think those are at definitely at the level of someone who's already interested in data and already in the data science world. And so I think a big part of it is engaging the people who aren't already in that space and who are maybe more ecology focused or focused on some other realm of biodiversity. Um, in terms of globalizing the materials, like literally making them available to more audiences, I think it's a matter of um, formatting, you know, you know, providing different formats for educational materials, providing more languages, which is something we're all still working on. Um, yeah, and I, I think the I think the main thing for us that we think about is engaging people at sort of all levels of knowledge, not just those that are already at this meeting and already thinking about publishing data and those types of things. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. Okay. All right. Well, um, every good thing must come to an end, and we're about to end. Uh, there's a request online for a virtual room for the uh, uh, virtual attendees. Uh, I, I've been told that it will be created. Um, so, so it's in the works. Uh, for those folks uh, who are physically here, uh, I, I think we're done. You want to comment? Okay, so. So I tried to capture all of the questions, you, more the questions than the answers, to be honest. Um, and, and I'm filling them into um, the Slack right now, but uh, feel free to go in there and correct me if I misunderstood something because some of the, with all of the, the different channels to follow, uh, I couldn't. Yeah, summarize all of the answers properly. So um, just to let you know that all of those who uh, have asked questions or uh, were asked questions, will get a lot of ad replies in the coming minutes in Slack. All right, so I would like a special hand for David, a great helper. And uh, let's do a, a self-referential type of applause here for all of you as well. Uh, and I'll see you in the coffee break. <laughs>